Well, good Lord's Day to you, Lakemont. Uh, before we begin, just I would love to ask for your prayers this week as both our regional church, the Savannah River Presbytery, and our own church's uh, session, our elders, are having meetings this week, so we would covet your prayers uh, for the Lord to work, the Lord to guide, the Lord to uh, give wisdom, and when necessary, for the Lord to overrule us. Uh, so please keep us in your prayers. If you would, please turn with me now uh, in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 21. Today we're going to continue the story of David's path to the kingship. Uh, last time, you'll recall, we saw a civil war among the people of God that began with Abner, the general of Israel's armies, and the real power uh, behind Saul's remaining surviving son, King Ishbosheth. And on the other side, we met Joab, <clears throat> David's nephew, and the general of his armies. And we saw the unwanted battle at Gibeon uh, lead to both Abner's defeat and to a tragic death during that retreat. Today we'll see how the Lord causes this war to end by using human sin and weakness on both sides. And through that, we will see how the Lord builds his kingdom, even in the midst of unselfishness, excuse me, of unfaithfulness, selfish ambition, and betrayal. My hope is that this text will give us encouragement that the Lord is still working to build his kingdom in our day in our church, and even in and among and through sinful people like us. So please follow along with me now in your Bible, 2 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam of Jezreel, and his second Kiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, and the third Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and the fourth Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ithriam of Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone in to my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David. And yet you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman. God do so to Abner and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, to whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. And he said, Good, I will make a covenant with you, but one thing I require of you, that is, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife Michael, for whom I paid the bridal price 
of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Baharim. Then Abner said to him, Go, return. And he returned. And Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some time past you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then, bring it about. For the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with twenty men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. And Abner said to David, I will arise and go, and will gather all Israel to my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. The word of God given to you, the people of God, by the Spirit of God, without error, and all for your good. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the scriptures, even when they too clearly remind us of the depravity of human nature, and when we too see our own sins portrayed vividly in the stories of your people. Lord, would you speak now so that we will both see our need for grace, but also see the hope of your work in us, through us, for us, and even often in spite of us. Be glorified, we pray now, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this was an exciting week in the life of our church as we broke ground for our new church facility on Pleasant Home Road. But as we think about that, it's good to be reminded the process of building something is almost always messy. As our church building will be built, a lot of dirt will be turned over, obstacles will be found and occur and be removed, and things will sometimes look messy and chaotic. But our comfort in that is to know that the plans are guiding our builder, and the end result will come through the mess. The Lord building his kingdom is a similar process, both in our text and continuing on in the world today until Christ comes again. Despite the mess and all the chaos, his plans are proceeding unhindered, and his good, pleasing, and perfect will is being done despite what seems like us to be troubling and difficult circumstances. D.A. Carson describes it succinctly in our chapter, bringing the different parts of the country together into united allegiance under David was a messy and sometimes ignoble business. A reminder that God sometimes uses the folly and evil of people to bring about his good purposes. That's really what we're going to see today pictures and principles of how God builds his kingdom with sinful people and amid a sinful and fallen world. First, we'll see he does this by strengthening the house of his sinful people, verses 1 through 5. We already briefly looked at verse 1 last time as a sort of summary of what happened in the chapter before of the civil war that continued after that battle at Gibeon. And we were told the house of David grew stronger and the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. Using the word house really emphasizes the familial component of this struggle. As one commentator put it, this conflict 
was fundamentally between two families vying for undisputed control over one nation, not two nations at war with each other. End quote. This summary statement clearly shows that God's purposes and his promise to David of the kingship is the difference in this war as he strengthens David's position. Verses 2 through 5 show us evidence of that strength in sons. Uh, but it also shows that the Lord's blessing was not due to David's merit or righteousness. You see, his strength is described with both the accumulation of six wives and six sons. In ancient time, the number of heirs that you produced and the leaders in your family strengthened your line of succession. And it ensured that the rule would remain in your house, in your family. But in doing this, the author is letting us know that there is a foreshadowing of the troubles David would face. Why? Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, when God uh, predicted Israel would one day want a king, and he told them very specifically the requirements and the rules for that king. And Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17 says, He shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. While the author of our text does not directly condemn this unlawful act, this polygamy that goes against God's design for marriage, the list here hints clearly at the problems that will come. Amnon, his firstborn, will forcibly violate his half-sister and then in turn be killed by her brother Absalom. We presume his second son, Kiliab, Abigail's son, died young as he is never mentioned again. Absalom not only murdered his brother, but he tries to take the kingdom from David later in another civil war. And Adonijah, the fourth son, will one day take advantage of David in his old age to try to stage a coup and seize power instead of allowing David's chosen successor, Solomon, to take the throne. All this comes because of David's sin, his polygamy, his lack of restraint of his desires, and let's say it, call it like it is, his foolishness. At least one of the marriages seemed to be for a political alliance, as it's noted that the wife was the daughter of the king of Geshur. The point of all that is, God is strengthening David's position because of his promise and not because of David's performance. Based on the later consequences we mentioned that David would experience, it's clear his worldly measure of strength here is actually a sign of cracks in the foundation, moral compromise. So this is not teaching us that our obedience and our holiness does not matter simply because God promises to work in spite of them. It does show us God is faithful to his promises. He can bless and strengthen us even, not because, at times when we are sinning, failing, or just flailing about. And there's a comfort in that. I've now been a pastor in three different churches. I've been involved in many others. And I have loved all of them. Most days. I can say unequivocally, all of them, at one time or another, have had serious issues, sin problems, conflicts, selfishness, flawed leadership, members who later demonstrate themselves to have been non-Christians, gossip, slander, unbecoming pettiness, and more. And yet these flawed assemblies, the church of God on earth, are the vehicles that God chooses to work through for his purposes. And all of those churches I've been involved in, the Lord has grown them in different ways. Use them for impact, 
changed lives as he worked in them and brought people even to faith through them, as flawed as they are. Why? So he gets the glory. Deuteronomy 9.5, among other places, explains the Lord does what he does in us and for us, not because of our righteousness, but for his purposes, for his glory. Paul would say it this way, we have this treasure, the gospel, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. So as we look at our own church, with all its warts and flaws and sins, and at times maybe we're tempted to despair, or as we look at our own lives, and if we're honest, we should definitely have reasons to despair at our sin and our foolishness. In those times, we can be comforted and encouraged that the Lord is true. He is strengthening his house. He is building his church for his purposes, and for the spread of his gospel to sinners like us, even through sinners like us. He will get the glory for what his church does in the world, and not the church itself. Even as he promises to build his church, he builds his kingdom also by weakening the enemies of the kingdom. Verses 6 through 11. Having shown us the strengthening of David's house, the author now shows us the means by which the Lord weakens Saul's house. We're told of dissension in the ranks. Abner has been growing in power and seeking to gain it, as verse 6 tells us, and King Ishbosheth confronts Abner with an accusation of intimacy with one of Saul's concubines that is more or less a second-class wife. And in that culture, going into a concubine of a former ruler was a way to claim the rights of that previous king. It's a power grab. We're not told whether it was true or not, but when he's accused, Abner is furious at the king's accusation. Verse 8, he fumes, and basically his response says, I've been loyal to this house. I made you king, and I can take you down. And so out of pragmatism, anger, and spite, he swears in verses 9 and 10, God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba, meaning all of it. Abner is the ultimate opportunist. His ploy failed to gain power. His puppet turned out not to be completely controllable. And so he's going now to the winning side, and he's going to use religion to justify it. Make your own application there. Now he embraces suddenly God's promise to make David king. Dale Ralph David describes it, Davis describes it, Abner only quotes scripture when it supports a pro-Abner move. Abner seeks the kingdom not because it is a matter of divine promise, but because it is now a piece of sharp policy. Not love for Yahweh's designs, but concern over Abner's position is all that matters to him. Again, we can easily draw our own application there of not using God's word for our own selfish means or misinterpreting it to get what we want. But whatever his motives, the Lord is using them for his purposes to ensure David's path to the throne of all Israel. God will keep his promise and Abner's self-seeking here would weaken David's opposition dramatically and decisively. This is how the Lord often works for his church and builds his kingdom. We see evidence in the Psalms, and we can say with David, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. 
He will return evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. Psalm 54, 4 and 5. And also acknowledge that, quote, the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Psalm 37, 20. We are called to love our enemies. But God's work, God describes himself as being weakening or removing them, either by conversion, confounding, or ultimately by their condemnation. Do you see the greatness of our God in this text? To use even things as lust, lust for power and pleasure that we saw in Abner, unbridled human ambition, greed, sin, and spitefulness, all kinds and forms of sin and transgression, to somehow bring about his good purposes. Again, that doesn't make those actions good, but God's hand behind them is good. At the very least, this truth, this picture, should lead us to praise and wonder at our sovereign God anew. And again, it should give us confidence as we sang last week, the church shall never perish, her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. He will strengthen his church. He will weaken his enemies. But he will also receive us eagerly on his terms. That's our third point, verses 12 through 19. Abner, as he swore, now goes to David, but seemingly not humbly. As verse 12 implies, to whom does the land belong? Abner means I control most of it. Make your covenant with me. Seems a bit presumptuous, considering he hasn't won a battle. But the rightful king makes it clear in his response. Abner's offer will be received, but on David's terms. He demands his wife, Michael, Saul's daughter, be returned to him, which again, as we saw with the concubine, would strengthen David's legitimacy as the king of all Israel, as Saul's successor. And he also turns Abner from a power broker into a middleman. By sending messengers back, not to Abner, but to Ishbosheth. Richard Phillips explains what this does. Abner was put in his place, having to approach David as a suppliant who offers gifts and not as a partner in crime that Abner clearly desired. And David upheld at least a semblance of legitimacy in his transactions, appealing not to Abner, but to Ishbosheth for the return of his first wife. End quote. So, Ishbosheth does what David commanded. Michael is returned, and we get the brief and sad episode of verse 16 with the grief of her second illegitimate husband. Even as we recognize his marriage to her was adulterous in the eyes of God, we feel for his pain. That is what marital sin, adultery, polygamy, all those things do. God's design, one man, one woman, for life. That's a side note. But Abner now speaks to the elders of Israel, to urging them to acknowledge now David as king, implying they've always wanted that. And we must give him credit. Even in his self-seeking, he speaks some truth here. Again, invoking the promise of God to David in verse 18. If God can speak out of a donkey, you know the rest. He also speaks specifically and wisely to the tribe of Benjamin, his tribe and Saul's tribe, which would have had the greatest allegiance to Saul and the most reluctance to embrace David. Again, God has arranged this. And so, whether willingly or not, he complies with David's terms, and he goes to tell David, Israel, including Benjamin, will follow him. David's enemies have come to be reconciled to him, and they come on his terms. Again, as we've seen throughout Scripture, 
David imperfectly points us to his greater son, Jesus Christ. Even as this passage teaches us, David's enemies could not dictate terms to him, but instead receive them. So it is in coming to the true and ultimate king, Jesus Christ. We come on his terms, not ours. One of the dangers of our consumer culture is that we become Abner's. We want Jesus, Christianity, church membership, life on our terms rather than his. And like David to Abner, Jesus does not receive us unless we meet his requirement. True faith and submission to him and repentance of our sins against him. And once we come to him, the terms are we must continue to submit to his terms from his word. That's evidence of our faith and repentance. He is the true king. We have to see ourselves as subjects, not lords. Do we find ourselves subconsciously, maybe only in our heads, dictating to Jesus what kind of life we think we should have, or dare I say, we think we deserve? Do we grumble and murmur about our circumstances instead of focusing on gratefully remembering all that he has given us graciously, freely? And the simplest test of following Christ on his terms is our obedience to him. Is it selective, picking and choosing? Is it wholehearted? Is it zealous? As John writes, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 5.3 Let me urge you, especially if you do not currently follow Jesus, submit to him, come to him, respond to your king. He calls each one of us. We have no excuse. And we are summoned to submit to him, to serve him, and all the days of our lives to live before him. And contrary to what the culture would say, contrary maybe to what your feelings might think about that, it is a joyful place to be. It is a source of peace. And that leads us to the final way we see God building his kingdom, by joyfully offering his peace to former rebels. Remember when, when Abner came to David and gave his offer, David said, good. He was eager for it. Well, now here as well, verses 20 and 21, as we conclude this part of the story, we see David again modeling Jesus as he joyfully celebrates and offers peace to the former rebels against his reign. Notice in verse 20, David provides, he makes a feast for those who were his former foes. Doesn't our Savior do the same thing for us in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? He feeds us, those of us who were his enemies, who are now considered his children. Doesn't Jesus tell us there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents? Luke 15, 10. And look how our passage ends. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. The conflict is over. And although we're not covering these verses today, the word peace is emphasized. It's mentioned not only verse 21, but it's repeated again in 22 and 23. David's peace was with Abner. It was upon him. Their conflict was over. His former enemy was now reconciled. John Woodhouse notes, this is a glimpse of the nature of God's king and his kingdom. Former rebels find peace. The history of Abner's relationship with David could be described as once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Colossians 1.21. Most recently, he was the power behind the war. 
verse 1, with which this chapter began, Woodhouse concludes, he was now reconciled, and this depended not on any goodness in him, but on the goodness of David. Similarly, Colossians 1, 22. Woodhouse makes the comparison clear. It is our king's goodness that he invites us, rebels and enemies from birth, to come to him and be reconciled, to enjoy his peace, his security, his favor, and his blessing. True peace is found nowhere else and in no one else. And if you have come to Jesus, we are told that now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. Making peace is costly. David's peace cost him his pride to offer it. Jesus' peace, peace cost him much more, his very life. Yet we are the beneficiaries when we come to him. And so as we see him bring peace to his former enemies, we now, his followers, are called to rest in, demonstrate, and live out his peace before a watching world. Brothers and sisters, my prayer is that our church, Lakemont, the people, not the building that is being built, might be and remain a place where we live according to our calling now as subjects of the King, to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, Ephesians 3.3, and to continue to embrace also our call that in a culture of hostility and outrage, tribalism, and unrest, to be a people of peace, imitating our king and longing to see his kingdom come, and submitting to his terms that we might work with his work in us to see the kingdom come more and more. I hope that's your prayer as well today. And again, if you do not know him, my prayer is that you will come to see that joy and peace and love and contentment ultimately only come by submitting and kneeling at his feet. I pray he works in your heart today by his spirit through his word. But now let's go to him in prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we rejoice that in Jesus we are part of your kingdom. And we echo the cry of the author of Hebrews saying, Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Lord, receive our worship. Receive these words. Use these words. Use your word. And Father... The desire of our hearts is even as you taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make it so, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, have a joyous week in the service and peace of your King. My love to you and my longing to see you, I hope go with you, but more importantly, as you read the benediction in a few moments, his peace and he himself go with you. God bless.